When David suggests his title as leader of the Christ fighters back in the summer, it seems to me that somewhat challenging and now it's being torn from the scene. But then it must have felt the skill when he was really having to be successful. After he's spoken all these times in Testament and Lancelot, and the very thoughts of the Green Lecture, showing that the Lord has been called to make a part of it, and the Greek says that they cast it all very much in Jesus' world, the scripture, they seem to have been quite well set. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sal. It's great to be here in your new home. Uh, Sally's been my colleague, my, my teacher, my counsel, and most important, my friend for nearly 30 years. So I feel really honored to have been asked by her to come and give this lecture tonight. Uh, in everything she's done, I've known Sally Morgan as a change maker, and she's been a change maker I know at Fitzwilliam as well. And all I can say to those of you from the Fitzwilliam community, you are lucky to have her. For those of you from the Cambridge community, you're also lucky to have her. And if my experience is anything to go by, when she tells you to do something, it's better to do it. <laughs> These are very, very serious times, so I'm just going to launch right in and really hope that we can get to some questions. I don't know about answers, but um, certainly a discussion. I, I think we all know that the world is richer, science more wondrous, possibility more limitless in 2023 than at any time in human history. But that is not the prevailing mood in many countries. It's certainly not the mood here nor in the United States, two countries I know best, nor in the places that the International Rescue Committee works. Precious human values seem to be in retreat, critical institutions as well, and the guardrails that they defend. The norms and sometimes the laws that embodied the lessons of the 20th century are under threat in the 21st. That makes th the times we're living in feel brutal, divisive, unforgiving, when what is actually needed in our connected world is care, consideration, common ground, and even second chances. These commitments to secure the best of human nature without being blind to the worst, to a big heart and to an open mind, are to me important ideals. And they need to be renewed. And that is what I wanted to address when I suggested to Sally in early summer, the title for this lecture, Idealism in a Time of Crisis, long before October the 7th. Today, of course, the title looks not just far more timely, but the question it seeks to address far more difficult than I would have wished. The crisis in Gaza overshadows everything. For us at the International Rescue Committee, the pain, the anger, the fear are raw as I think they are in many parts of the world. At the IRC, we have family and friends of colleagues who've been lost, kidnapped, or injured in Israel and in Gaza. An IRC team on the ground in Egypt is desperately trying to get aid in and support for the civilians inside Gaza. We have 1,800 staff in Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq, and Syria, desperate about the fate of Palestinian civilians and the danger of regional conflagration. Jewish staff and Muslim staff outside the Middle East are fearful of attacks on them. Someone wrote to me and said, quote, I feel I'm falling into a dark, bottomless hole with nothing to grab onto. Going through this as a mother hurts even more. That just about sums, sums it up. I originally chose the title, however, because in pretty much every speech 
or event I do, I'm asked the following question. How do you or how do your teams stay optimistic given the crises that you're dealing with? This is a real question for a mission-driven organization like the International Rescue Committee with 24,000 employees and 20,000 more volunteers in over 300 field sites around the world, all of whose common denominator is crisis. I usually give the same answer. Look at the statistics and you get depressed, but look at the people and you have hope. There's some truth, actually, in that answer, but since I'm at Cambridge University, where I understand that facts matter, it's important to remember that the facts from Professor Steven Pinker and others actually show that in many ways things are getting better, not worse. So we need to little bit dig a little deeper beyond the answer I usually give. Here's what I'm going to try and do in the next 25 or 30 minutes. First, I'm going to follow the US, the United States national security strategy in linking the question of crisis, in fact, multiple crises, reflecting multiple global risks to the shift in geopolitics towards the fragmentation of power. I don't think you can understand one, the rise in global risks, without understanding the other, the fragmentation of political power. Second, I'm just going to offer three reflections, lessons is maybe too strong a word, of my own experience at the International Rescue Committee. I think we sustain idealism in times of crisis through a bias to action, through emba embrace of risk, and through articulation and defense of universal values. And I'll say something about all three. And third, I'm going to say something about politics and policy here in the UK as the country enters an election year after a decade in which I would say crisis rather than idealism, exploiting problems rather than solving them, has held the upper hand. The UK, in my view, needs a politics of shared purpose and of common endeavor if, if it is to combat the economic and social riptides that we face. So let me start with crisis in a new context. If you ask the new Oracle, chat GPT, the question, is the world in crisis? The answer starts, yes. Nouriel Roubini, who famously predicted the 2008-09 financial crisis, has written a book devoted to listing 10 mega threats from financial instability and trade wars to demography and AI. And our former prime minister, my former boss, Gordon Brown, has written a book with Mohammed al Aryan, who is here, called Perma Crisis. That was the Collins word of the year in 2022. Somehow, I wasn't surprised, and you may not be surprised, to learn that Mohammed and Gordon and their Nobel Prize winning economist co-author argue in their book that things went right when economics was in charge, when economics drove politics, <laughs> and things went wrong since politics took over. Anyway, David Runciman, who's professor of politics here, has defined a crisis as follows. When a system, a system of government, of finance, or an organization, ceases to function in a way that is sustainable. War, I suppose, is the ultimate proof that a system cannot endure. Now, the crisis in the Middle East is such a crisis, but it's not an isolated example. There are 50, over 50, civil conflicts going on around the world at the moment. There are 110 million people fleeing those conflicts as internally displaced people, as refugees, as asylum seekers. Just for reference, that 110 million, there were 40 million 10 years ago. There are 350 million people facing what is called food insecurity. I was at the government's food security summit today in London. That means those 350 million people are at the UN standard of hunger of level three or higher. All you need to know is that level five is famine and nine countries, according to the UN, are facing that. In plain terms, it means 350 million people don't know where their next meal is coming from. Three years ago, the figure was one third that level. And of course, the biggest crisis of all, the climate crisis, is truly an existential crisis, and it's shockingly unaddressed. This is the world that my colleagues at the International Rescue Committee confront every day. If these statistics don't justify the word crisis, I don't know what does. 
And if you think about the people that we're trying to serve, they're actually dealing with multiple crises. The forcibly displaced and abused in DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, Syria, Ethiopia, Afghanistan, or Myanmar, not just Gaza, are confronting crisis in all of its dimensions. Poverty, compounded by tumult, compounded by impunity. There's a word for this, promulgated by Professor Adam Toobes, and the word is polycrisis. And he defines it as follows, quote, a problem becomes a crisis when it challenges our ability to cope and thus threatens our identity. In the polycrisis, the shocks are disparate, but they intersect, so that the whole is even more overwhelming than the sum of the parts, end of quote. I think this is a pretty good description of what is going on. This is an age of interdependence, when everything doesn't just seem connected, but actually is connected. Climate is linked to conflict, is linked to health, to migration, to the economy, to political malaise. When we were in government in the 1990s, we talked about a connected world. Today, it's hyper-connected, and the rise of multiple crises needs to be linked to a change in geopolitics. I've been living outside the UK, as Sally said, for 10 years now. I can't really believe how quickly the time has gone by or how much has changed or has happened. COVID, Trump, Brexit, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, five UK prime ministers, Corbyn, now the war between Israel and, Gaza, and, and Hamas in Gaza. The longer I'm away, strangely, peculiarly, interestingly, the more British I feel. But while I feel more British, the last decade has given me a much more global view. And what I see is a world, especially a geopolitical world, that is much more fluid, much more competitive, much more risky, much more sharp-elbowed than I saw before. A world of opportunity and possibility, yes, but a world burdened by new and growing risks at a time when there is multi-alignment. And I just want to pause on that idea of a multi-aligned world for a moment. I think we'd all be used to, we might have heard the idea of a multipolar world. It means a world that has more than one center of power with wealth or military or other sway that balances American power, essentially. China's very keen on the idea of multipolarity, so is Brazil, also important countries in the so-called global south. But I think that the idea of multipolarity is too comforting in the sense that it suggests a degree of order and stability, an idea of balance that isn't present in the world today. The world I see is much more unstable than a balanced multipolar world with many more players, private sector as well as non-state actors, as well as nation states, not just a small number of serious power blocks with many more cross-cutting alliances than is conveyed by the idea of a fixed number of power centers. Now, there is a term for this. 15 years ago, the Indian diplomat Shashi Tharoor, now an Indian opposition politician, coined the idea of a multi-aligned world. Today, the Indian government, in the form of its foreign minister, is using the term again. And if you look at the way India is part of the Quad, USA, USA, Australia, Japan, India. It sits in the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. It chairs the G20. It asks the UAE, Saudi, Saudi Arabia, Ethiopia, Egypt, and Iran to join the BRICS. It sits in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. You can see why it's more appropriate to foresee a world of many world orders, not just one. It's a world of overlapping, transactional, shifting alliances. And that is even before you begin to think about private sector actors, private sector players, civil society as well. And in our work, we see this every day. I'll mention a crisis that's getting zero coverage at the moment in Sudan. Egypt and the UAE are on different sides. So are Turkey and Russia. The push and pull has neutered diplomatic pressure to protect the people of the country from an outbreak of conflict that's becoming a nightmare across the northeast, the whole of Northeast Africa. Western diplomacy is in balk in this world. It's snookered. 
The story in Syria, Myanmar, Afghanistan, Burkina Faso is the same. No global order, and its absence has created the space for many local and regional disorders. So, there's growing global risk that defines the age of crisis, and it interacts with fragmentation of political power. And if you think about it, one reinforces the other. Crisis exacerbates political fragmentation. Just think about the crisis in Gaza. And political fragmentation exacerbates the crises. Just think about the response to COVID. Now, you will be relieved to hear that there is a separate lecture about how to strengthen the global order in the face of these crises. It's usually given by Professor Lawrence Friedman, who's here and is able to do it much better than I can. But that's not my exam question tonight. My exam question tonight is how to sustain idealism at a time of crisis exacerbated by political fragmentation. And my response comes in the form of the three lessons, the three reflections that I've learned over the last 10 years in leading an organization whose mission statement is precisely to help people whose lives have been shattered by crisis and disaster to survive, recover, and gain control of their futures. So I'm going to move on to that. That's the second thing I want to talk about. There's a brilliant book by a woman called Rebecca Solnit called A Paradise Built in Hell. And it's about major disasters since 1906, the San Francisco earthquake through to Hurricane Katrina. Not just in America, by the way, all over the world. And she says two things matter. She says crisis demonstrates what's possible or what more accurately what's latent. And second, they demonstrate how most of us desire connection or participation or altruism. But that's not, I think, I think that's important, but it doesn't quite get to the question of how you sustain hope and idealism in the face of multiple crisis. More important than what she says, I think, is the following. Action creates hope rather than hope creating action. If you think about it, that probably explains why I'm running a humanitarian agency and not an academic institution or a think tank. I don't just learn from being close to the action. I sustain my own in idealism. I get my energy and hope from trying to make a difference in the midst of the crisis. When I talk to IRC teams who are in Kharkiv in northeast Ukraine, 36 hours after the Russians are forced out, or when I speak to colleagues who work in northwest Syria for people living under an armed opposition group, I can feel how they are engaged and energized by their work, and so am I. This is what makes our inability to make a difference at the moment in Gaza, because of the fighting and its nature, so frustrating. I know that the bias to action has got a bad rap from the association with the Silicon Valley culture of break things and see what happens. But action does not have to be about breaking things. That's the Zuckerberg fault, if you like. Action doesn't have to be about breaking things. It can be about mending them. This is how the bias to action is important to me in offering hope. To stop there, however, is to risk exhaustion, because action that is ad hoc, is that Zuckerberg on the phone, because I mentioned him, I don't know. Uh, to stop there is to risk exhaustion, because action that is ad hoc, uncoordinated, unstrategic, is less than the sum of its parts. You're chasing your tail. This is my second lesson. Strategy without action is barren, but action without strategy is ineffective. And the heart of strategy is how much risk are you willing to take. I use our strategy every day. It helps me decide what to do, what not to do. It brings together the means at our disposal, which are essentially operations with impact and scale, alongside thought leadership to fulfill our mission. The strategy is the discipline that helps me say no as well as yes, the North Star that makes me push myself and my teams to do better, not just more. And I want to highlight one part of the strategy that I think is re relevant to the sustenance of idealism and hope. We now have a $1.5 billion a year budget, as uh, Sally said, actually 1.6 billion for fiscal year 24. 3% uh, of the global humanitarian sector, but 30% of all the impact and evidence evaluations that are done of what works in humanitarian settings in delivering humanitarian aid. 
I know from my time in politics that the phrase what works is derided as a North Star for politics. I, I confess I never understood this. If technocratic means asking whether interventions work, isn't that a good thing, not a bad thing? But you can't be interested in what works unless you're also interested in finding out what doesn't work. And that means you have to embrace risk. For obvious reasons, this is very hard in government. But if you don't risk failure, you will never achieve success. And we have a really interesting example in my own organization of this. It's about the funding of what we call our innovation fund. Our funders press us to answer the question, what proportion of your projects fail? And the worst possible answer is zero. If you say that none of your projects fail, you get no money. You won't get a penny for that, for the very simple reason that if you have a failure rate of zero in your innovation team, you're not taking enough risk. It's completely countercultural to the methods of government. But in our round one innovations, our failure rate is 40%, and we're quite proud of it. We're actually trying to push it up because it's derided as too low. That's why our major innovations in early childhood learning, in malnutrition treatment, in information provision for refugees, are private sector funded. Those people are comfortable with the risk and urge us to go further. So hope comes from the freedom to take calculated, organized, strategic risks. Because without risks, you can't learn or make progress. The third lesson is about the defense of universal human values. It suggests that politics can't just be for politicians. Because crisis smashes the boundaries between politicians and the rest of us. To the extent that politics is about the compromises by which we all live, crisis makes us all politicians. Politics, in this sense, is a process of finding out what we share. It's about generating collective action. And compromise in this model is not about timidity. It's actually about bringing people together, which is 100 times harder in the middle of conflict. But it's more necessary than ever. In my view, the times call for voice to be used to argue for our common humanity, to make the case for the universal values set out in the UN Charter, founded on the dignity and agency of every individual. That, I think, is what is under threat today. We don't need new rules or new laws, whether on civilian protection or human rights or state sovereignty. We need to defend the rules that actually exist and were signed up to after the Second World War. In the humanitarian sector, we're on the side of civilians. Our sector needs to stay out of party politics, which we do, because we're pledged to remain neutral, impartial, and independent in conflict. So we act stay out of partisanship in conflict, too. But we run into politics all the time as we seek to speak up for our staff and the safety they need, for our clients and the services we deliver, and our ethical code and the demands that it makes. Sometimes the demands of staff safety or of politics mean we can't say what we think. But when we call out impunity, call for aid or grain deals or cross-border aid or adherence to the laws of war, we're sustaining idealism and hope because in crisis, our values are needed more than ever. So these three lessons about the bias to action, the embrace of risk, and the defense and articulation of universal values have one, I think, very important point in common. They challenge the traditional model of how to achieve social, economic, and political change. That model is linear and top-down. It's hierarchical, singular, closed model of change. But when government is in retreat, which in so many countries it is, from big problems, then change has to be led from the outside. You can't wait for it to come from the top. From the outside means from business, from NGOs, from academia, from civil society. And I think the crises that we face demand a response that is far more open, far more, if you like, generative, more adequate, to a multi-aligned world than the traditional model of how to achieve change. This is my biggest learning from 10 years out of politics. I still believe strongly that governments have to deliver what they promise. The failure of the current government and its predecessors to deliver in the UK in the last 10 years has corroded confidence in those governments, but also in the very idea 
of effective government. But today, I increasingly think that elected politics has to be a vehicle to create possibility rather than just to deliver outcomes. And I want to finish by just explaining that idea of politics as a generative process of generating possibility, not just delivery. And then we can get to questions. I mentioned Adam Tooze, Professor Adam Tooze earlier, and his idea of polycrisis. It's the idea that multiple crises feed off each other. It's of the essence of the polycrisis that the answer has to be multiple, not just singular. This is what Adam Tooze says. There's no single denouement, no grand finale in the style of a Wagner opera to the polycrisis. Quote, modern history, and Bertrand Russell actually said that history ran till 1900, everything afterwards was family gossip. So I don't know if that's, I don't think that's uh, Adam Tooze's uh, definition. I think by modern history, he really means the history of the last 20 to 30 years. He says the following, modern history appears as a tale of progress by way of improvisation, innovation, reform, and crisis management. Our tightrope walk with no end is only going to become more precarious and nerve-wracking. I think it's a really powerful and instructive phrase. Improvisation, innovation, reform, crisis management. That's the playbook. It's a vision of change as the creation of different possibilities. And if it's right, I think it has important implications for the big decisions that Britain has to make over the next few years, which is where I want to draw to a close, the case of the UK and its crisis. I think there's a good case that we've managed to create our own poly crisis in this country. Low growth, higher tax, austerity, Brexit, downgraded public realm, destruction of political trust, they constitute a poly crisis. It's much more like the 1970s than the 1990s when we were running from opposition into government. But things are moving much faster. The outside world has changed. And the danger for Britain is that we get outrun. My own view is that politics has let the country down. The Conservatives let the country down by abandoning their historic role to be conservative. The clue is in the name. Brexit was the ultimate leap in the dark, trading something for nothing. And I don't believe any Tory party since the repeal of the Corn Laws would have taken this risk. But Labour let the country down by failing to provide an, elected, an electable alternative. The Corbyn years betrayed what Labour, my party, is supposed to stand for, and not just because of the anti-Semitism. So the statistics on economic performance, poverty levels, even child height in the UK are depressing. Our separation from geopolitical power out of the EU and in the peripheral vision of an increasingly transactional US, and I see that every day and we can come back to that, is real. But to come back where, to something I said at the beginning, if you look at the people anywhere in the country, in this room or elsewhere, and what they're doing, instead of looking at the politics, you have hope. That's what I feel every time I go back to my constituency, my old constituency in South Shields, where we continue to feel at home and inspired by what people are doing. So the issue we face as a country in tackling our own poly crisis is one of process, not just policy. It'd be a mistake to think that there's just a policy answer. And it leads me to think about how the lessons of how to sustain hope apply. A bias to action, a willingness to take intelligent knowing risks, and the need to see politics as a collective creative effort not just an elite project. I think Britain needs some of that. It needs a lot of it, actually. And I found an interesting historical parallel to finish with. In all the talk about what should be Labour's quote-unquote retail offer, I'm reminded more and more of an essay by R.H. Tawney after the 1931 election debacle that all but obliterated the Labour Party. He derided the idea, Tawney, that politics consisted of offering, quote, larger and larger carrots. The phrase actually goes on to say who the carrots were being offered to, but I won't use that phrase because it might imply something about uh, 
it, it, it downgrades the electorate in not a nice way. But he derided the idea of politics as being about larger and larger carrots. Instead, he said, it should be about, I, I, he also said, by the way, that Labour's manifesto in 1931 offered too much and demanded too little, which is an interesting phrase. He called for Labour to espouse a politics of shared purpose, shared struggle, and shared possibility. I think we need to level up about the challenges we face. It's absurd to believe that telling the truth is talking the country down. It's actually the first step to building the country up. And this, it seems to me, is the potential of the missions that Keir Starmer has announced will guide him in the run-up to the election and then if he's elected to government, in government. He has five missions for the country. They're aspirational, but they're also honest about where we start. Read any of the background papers to his speeches and they're unflinching about economic decline, about an NHS driven to decay, about communities that feel marginalized. But I think these missions are in danger of being misunderstood in the commentary. They're missions for the country, not just missions for the Labour Party or for a Labour government. Seen in that way, those missions are a way to fuel idealism. They're not about what government does for people. They're not about what government delivers for people. They're what government and people do together. They're missions for the country, not just missions for the government. Creating possibility for the talent, resilience, and creativity of communities all across the country and sectors all across economy and society to come together and make change. Government in this model is a catalyst, partnering in change, not always delivering it. The missions for Britain that Keir Starmer has said, therefore, are a project for all of us, not just a promise of the politicians. That is truly the way to sustain idealism in a time of crisis. Thank you very much indeed. That was, uh, that was incredibly disciplined, <laughs> very, very, very disciplined. Um, the first thing to say, David, is that though it's very good to see you, it's also slightly depressing, because whilst you haven't changed at all in 12 <laughs> years, <laughs> the rest of us all had. Um, I wish that uh, was true. So if there's something in the air in New York for you, that'd be great. I, I think wish. almost the last time I spoke to you one-on-one -on -one was when you were foreign secretary, and you were standing there looking out over horse guards, and you were thinking about the Durand line. Um, the line in Afghanistan and so on, and that kind of takes me back, and then it all came back again, as these things do. First question, I mean, l lots of distinguished people here who want to ask questions, and they're all going to be questions. Um, speeches will be delivered on the way home. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> but the first thing that I, I just rather wonder after your speech is whether or not crises aren't the easy bit. Um, a crisis, almost by definition, restricts the range of choices you have available to you to deal with it. It's what comes before the crisis that is so difficult. It's organizing what you know probably should be done with the National Health Service and the health of the country significantly before you hit any of the problems, but for various reasons are difficult to do. I just give that as an example. Um, uh, and of course, you've been dealing with crises, but you also presumably have thought a bit about what led to those crises and what longer term things you could have put in place or thought about doing in order to try and avoid them. So that's a really interesting point. Mm. Crisis breaks things open. And so it's a moment that allows for change because it breaks the old order. I have to say, it doesn't feel easy uh, in the middle of it. Um, but I, th I guess what you're saying is that telling people there's a crisis coming is not a call to action. Is that, that's, the, that's the basics of the question, is it? Um, actually, it's more like this, really. You do actually have less choice in a crisis than you do in the long period before it. That's really my point. Uh, I, yeah, so I think the opposite. I think that the crisis means that you don't have to make the argument for change. Okay. Uh, it's before the crisis hits that denial is what defines the vested interests that are propping up the old order. And it's denialism that is the greatest blocker on making change. I mean, if you think about the climate crisis, 
for 30 years, 40 years, there's been denialism that has just got in the way of warnings that rises in the average global temperature would be associated with more extreme weather events. It's very hard to deny that now, but the greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere are going to be there for another 100 years. So I think that the crisis breaks things open, and that's why they say don't waste a good crisis. They don't say don't waste a good pre-crisis. And so I think that the, 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 the danger is that in the crisis it's too late because the elastic is broken. And that's really, I think, the most difficult thing. The biggest challenge we face in as we, as we look, the two biggest challenges, how do you get upstream to roots of problems? I said there were 50 civil conflicts around the world. How you get upstream to, to that and how the people affected by them do is very, 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 very hard. But the second thing that is really, that, that really holds us back is that we can warn that something's going wrong, but until it does, it's hard to get the coalition for change. And so I'm, I, think, I think actually the crisis is the moment. Um, a second uh, question that I want to ask you rises out of the notion of idealism. Um, it appears through quite a lot of this that we live in an era of misplaced idealism, um, where the values of liberal universalism, which were widely accepted and which a lot of us would argue actually are still the most important and the most valid set of values that we can hold, are actually under assault, not just by idealists on the right, but by idealists on the left, who have forsaken some of the values of liberal universalism. And part of the problem for liberal universalists is precisely being liberal, it's very hard to kind of construct the, um, the spirit of, uh, of, of, of battle which you need in order to defend those values and take them forward. Do you find that? And I'm thinking particularly uh, in the context of, this of, say, the United States, where you have significant problems on campus, let's say, which is only kind of one part of it, and the real possibility of the re-election of Donald Trump next year on the other side. I mean, I think that two things I'd say about that. One, it's always really important to remember that the, the Twitter sphere is not the real world. And so the polarization that exists from the noisiest um, is not necessarily where the real numbers are. But secondly, what I see in the United States as incredibly frightening, what magnifies the size of the ends of the distribution of political views, is the idea that you only talk to people who agree with you. And the media scape in the US is such that it's very unusual for a politician or an activist to go on a TV show where the interviewer doesn't already agree with them. So the idea of common space where there is argument over judgments rather than over facts is really, is quite terrifying. It's the difference, if you like, between polarized, people often say, America's polarized. The danger is it's balkanized. And balkanized is that different communities hate each other, not just that they're opposed to each other. And I, I, I really fear th the loss of the, the common ground. Now, it's three time zones, it's a, it's a continent, it's a, I in a way, it's, it's sort of set up, and its history is set up to almost magnify that danger. But if it is a two horse race, then both candidates have a chance of winning. So the, the prospect that you raise is a perfectly legitimate one. But I, I, I also want to remember that all around the world, there are extremes, but there are also people prospering on the basis of the, if you like, the, the liberal universalist values that you're worried about. I, we do a lot of work in the African continent. We work in 20 countries where there are real problems. It's very important that we don't forget about the 35 countries that are actually not consumed by them. So I'm, I'm not willing to give up yet. Good. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, uh, finally, who should I be most afraid of, Donald Trump or Elon Musk? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think they, they're often in tandem. Um, and, you know, they're, 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 a, they're a very, they're a poisonous duo, really. I mean, the, um, the, the, 
leading a U.S. headquartered organization, but um, we, we, ha we experienced the Trump years very, um, very much on our turf, because as well as being an international humanitarian aid organization, we're a refugee resettlement agency in 30 American cities. Mm. And we were founded by Albert Einstein, who was a refugee in America. And he set up the organization in the 1930s. He, he, there are these letters from him to Eleanor Roosevelt pleading with her, her to persuade her husband, the president, to allow European Jews, essentially, and other persecuted minorities to come to America. And out of frustration that he couldn't, that Eleanor Roosevelt couldn't persuade Franklin Roosevelt, he set up the International Rescue Committee to organize um, escape for, in the end, 2000, 2,000 people, including Marc Chagall, Albert Hirschman, the uh, economist, um, were evacuated from occupied France by the International Rescue Committee. So the fact when, when Donald Trump said no Muslims allowed into the U.S., when he tried to abolish, the, he, he reduced the number of refugees being allowed in on refugee resettlement from 90,000 a year to 12,000 a year. So um, what, what, I'd, what had been described to me as a bipartisan consensus suddenly became the focus of political political division. Um, but obviously the fuel was that he mastered the social media far in advance of, of anybody else, and he, he, he used it to power his insurgency, and it was insurgent politics, and it's not gone away. Right. Um, I'm going to take some questions and observations. Uh, <laughs> is that you, Raphael? That was very, very, very journalistically quick. Um, so if we could get the mic over there to... to I didn't to think this was a press uh, conference. I thought it was... Uh, no, he's just quick. He's oh really quick. He's always been quick. Hello, hello, David and David. Um, do I identify myself, or should I just ask a question? Um, uh, if you just say who you are, Raphael, yeah. I think that would be I'm great. Raphael Tell Bear. everybody you're Raphael Bear. I'm Raphael Bear. Um, so, uh, David, uh, yeah, I was struck that you framed um, and your account of one of the threats, particularly in terms of challenges to the post-war liberal democratic order, and obviously I, I don't need any persuading that that's a very important thing, um, and you'll know that I sympathize strongly with that, but I worry sometimes, and I wonder what you think about this, when you think, for example, about uh, some of the complaints about, for example, Britain's membership of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, one of the more subtle arguments is that actually, while those values, the post-war values, are terribly noble of their time, they are kind of obsolete now, and we're in the third decade of the 21st century, uh, and these things have to be rethought. And I wonder, for those of us who are thinking about idealism in those terms, is there a danger that it's nostalgic and backward-facing and that we're clinging to something that is now sufficiently old that we're not articulating what a third decade of the 21st century idealism so that is like a great new institutions would be? That's, very, that's a great question. And I, as I um, worked in the sort of 2016 to 2019 period on my ideas about impunity and the rise of impunity and the challenge to the post-war. I, I had an interesting exchange with Laurie about you've got to be careful not to um, glorify or, um, or sugarcoat the post-war period. I mean, there was plenty of impunity in the post-war war period, and I, I take that very seriously. There's no, it, it's wrong to have a golden age, is it? Having said that, I do think this argument that I, that I just slight lightly referred to, that the point about the post-1945 settlement, which was signed up to by communists and capitalists and democrats and autocrats, was that it learnt the lessons of the, especially the interwar period, but actually of, of longer than that. And I find it that saying we don't need to reinvent the rules, we need to live up to them, is actually a way of avoiding nostalgia. And it also gets us on to the practical business of, of what needs to be done. And so I, I don't think it is about nostalgia. I think it's about principles by which we can live together. And the post-Second World War order did not dictate that countries should be democracies, not um, capitalists. Oh, sorry, d democracies, not autocracies. What it said was that the rights of civilians, of citizens, of refugees, of others, children, should balance the rights of states. That was actually the founding idea. It was the first time in human history that the rights of individuals had been enshrined in law 
alongside the rights of states. There's an argument, it wasn't co-equal, but that instantiation of individual human rights alongside states' rights, I think was a massive step forward and it should be a source of idealism. It's what we're lacking today. That's why I started by saying brutality, so instant judgment, is the antithesis of the accountability and of the deference to human pluralism that the post-Second World War settlement tried to summon up. And I defy anyone to read the first page of the UN Charter and not think it's actually an idealistic document, not a nostalgic document, and that we need more of it. Yes. Um, there's someone just here. Uh, if you're at the back and you've got your hand up and I can't see you, there's a key light just here in here, so you may have to just sort of yell a little bit. Simon McDonald, Christ College. I have two questions, they're very brief, you may not want to answer one of them. <laughs> First, building on what Raphael said, you talk a lot about universal values, but do you really think the Chinese and Russians sign up to what we think of these as universal values? And my second question is, do you want to be Foreign Secretary of the United <laughs> Kingdom? <laughs> uh, just on the, um, <laughs> surprisingly enough, the first one, uh, the, um, there's, a, there's a friend of mine, Rana Mitter, who's a uh, brilliant scholar of uh, China and its history. And he's got this absolutely fascinating book out, which shows that one of the animating efforts of the, um, of the current leadership in China is to claim Chinese credit for the creation of the post Second World War settlement, even though it was before 1949 and before the creation of the People's Republic. So that's kind of interesting. Secondly, if you read the February the 4th document 2022, the Chinese-Russian friendship without limits, and I was astonished, it's sort of trying to re argue about who's more democratic. It's trying to hold on to the, it's trying to say we've got our own democracy. Now, I'm not naive, so I don't fall for that. But I think that my, my perspective is, is, is the following. There is a chance, or uh, two things. One, if we don't live up to our own values, we're never going to be able to argue for them. So that's the first thing. Secondly, I do think the issue in international relations is about the rule of law and, accountable and accountability, not about democracy. That the international argument for the 2020s and beyond is accountability versus impunity, not democracy versus autocracy. And I think that is I chair something called the, um, the, the, the advisory board, something called the Atlas of Impunity, which is a, the, o the world's only annual measure on five indicators, conflict, governance, human rights, economic exploitation, and environmental degradation, which we see as an, ex an example of impunity. It, it measures every country in the world on those five indices. And part of my passion about that is that it asks the hard questions of some of the countries that are often lecturing us about the extent to which we're hypocritical or not about living up to our own values and I, I, I think we should we should think what's the right thing for us to argue for and argue for it with much more consistency and vigor and then see how the cards fall to be honest I don't think I think that the I think the Russian and the Chinese case, you know this as well as I do, they're different, very different. And so I'll dodge that part of the question. And the second question, I've been Foreign Secretary. <laughs> yes, as David Cameron didn't say last week. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's, somebody, there's somebody right near the back, towards the middle, waving their hand. Um, 
Skype on? I can't. I was a shout. There's no one. Uh, I think it probably is on. It usually is. And then um. what happens is you think it's not and you turn it off again. Um, but shout anyway. Great, great. Are you, are you Harriet's son? Yeah. Small world. Uh, nice, nice. I saw your mum on the Saturday, so. <laughs> can we, can uh, we have a bit less of this? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> um, uh, so we have four research and innovation priorities. Uh, ending taxing child mal malnutrition, uh, education and technology, climate resilience, sexual and reproductive health, maternal and newborn. These are the four areas where there is the least evidence of what actually works in the humanitarian sector. And I said in round one of our innovation fund, we're trialing different seed ways of strengthening seeds for climate change. We're trying different ways of facilitating computer-aided learning for kids who are, have their education disrupted. And all through this, y you, can, you can try things that don't work. You can try radio. You can try... Um, we've got a talking pen that's now started uh, working that we're using in parts of Africa. So in all these areas, we're, tr we're, we're, we're trialing things to see if they work. And our approach is to start right at the ground level with behavioral scientists, not just humanitarian aid workers, data uh, workers in the field, um, clients themselves, to figure out what's the way, what's the way around. And so I'll give you, give you one example. Um, in tackling malnutrition, at the moment, in the places that we work, 70 to 80% of acutely malnourished kids under the age of five get no help at all. And one reason is that UNICEF is responsible for severe acute malnutrition, and the World Food Program is responsible for moderate acute malnutrition, even though they're the same disease. UNICEF used something called ready-to-use therapeutic food. World Food Program used ready-to-use supplementary food different protocols mandated by the World Health Organization. We, we said malnutrition is the same disease, so you need a single protocol for assessing it, and it can be done by community health workers, it doesn't need doctors. We developed the upper arm circumference to help measure, which is a, a proxy measure for uh, malnutrition, and then we tried different ways of teaching essentially low literacy, no, low numeracy, community health workers, how to do the measurement, how to do the recording systems. And we've got a plethora of different fail failures in, in how to do that, but we've now done a study in Mali of a particular approach to training. 27,000 kids in Mali have been treated in this way, 92% success rate in tackling the acute malnutrition. And it's actually one of the, the simplest ways of doing it. So if you, if you actually go to, to rescue.org, our website, you'll see the full history uh, in these four areas, and it's, it's, it's exciting because you can see how fast test, fast fail leads you to um, a, a position where you can then do a randomized control trial of what actually works, and you can act and you can go and prove it. Yes, please, right at the front here. Um, I actually, they may not be able to hear you right at the back. Thank you very much. V very interesting, uh, very enjoyable, and very thought provoking two questions, if I may, trying to find a solution to the crisis rather than merely measuring it, although you helped us there. Well, how, do, how do we refresh leadership? Or what thoughts do you have on refreshing leadership? And secondly, what role can or should faith play in finding solutions? Um, well, Thanks. one way is to vote your leaders out. So that's, um, <laughs> that's, that, that's the great benefit of democracy is that it allows you to effectuate um, change. Don't, we, don't get me wrong, but some people would argue that political careers are too short, not too long these days. So <laughs> there's a quite a sort of t uh, turnover, although in the US, it's kind of the opposite, um, the opposite issue. M my own perspective is that big change happens when you get government leadership 
business and NGO innovation and mass mobilization. But they don't have to happen in that order. And when the government leadership is in retreat, then it's either the business and NGO innovation or the mass mobilization that moves forward and then the, the politicians end up following. Sometimes too late, many problems not tackled, but my own sense is that in the democratic world, the short-termism of politics means that the long-term solutions are going to have to be developed outside mm. and we're going to have to persuade the politicians to come in behind. And that's, what, that's why we talk about the IRC as a solutions NGO. Everyone knows there's a lot of suffering. The question is what the solutions are. And then to answer the first, you referenced, uh, th there's no, uh, my point is, there's no one solution. The, 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 mul the poly crisis, the multiple crisis, needs multiple solutions. That's why when people say, well, what's the answer to climate change? You've got to find all the above. Um, in respect of faith communities, it's interesting, my own organization um, was founded as a secular organization, but the majority of our work is now in a Muslim-majority countries. Um, we help people irrespective of uh, their faith. We partner with some obvious organizations, um, World Vision, other um, global charities, Islamic Relief are a partner of ours, not just in humanitarian aid, but in refugee resettlement in the US. But we also have some brilliant, brilliant partners that, you'd that you maybe wouldn't think of. So one of the things that is a massive issue for us and for our clients is domestic violence, intimate partner violence, violence against w men against women, basically, <coughs> and especially husbands against their wives. And one of our one of our real efforts has been to figure out how can you find, we've got good programs from the 90s about how you can intervene, but not good ways of taking them to scale. So we've done this fantastic program in uh, Uganda uh, with the Church of Uganda, the established church, starting hyper-local. It turns out that if you want to have a wedding with the Church of Uganda, you have to have, I think it's five or six um, sessions with the clergy beforehand pre-marital sessions. They've never included domestic violence as an issue in those sessions. We've trialed what happens if you include domestic violence as part of your pre-marital meetings with the clergy. Blow me down, the levels of domestic violence after marriage plummet. So we've now got an agreement with the Church of Uganda that every one of their pre-marital guidance sessions, they don't just cover finance and child rearing, they, ra they, they get into the domestic violence. And so the, 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 the networks of faith communities all around the world of all types become real implementation partners in quite interesting ways. And you can imagine the dialogue is also interesting. So I think Pluralism is the, is the essential virtue of liberal internationalism, in my view. It's under greatest assault. And you've got to then embrace the pluralists. And the faith communities often are part of that, but not always. And that's the challenge. Sally, how many have more we take? Five minutes. Okay. Um, we may get two in. So there's a woman there in the middle. If we just get the right front of there. And we've got a woman over there. There's a lady up on the top. There's a lady up at the oh, oh, sorry, I didn't even know you were up there. Gillian's up I'm there. Hello, so Gillian. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Gillian's very, we'll take, we'll take very the rich, shy and retiring. But we'll, the we'll, take uh, the, we'll, we'll take the woman in the middle there, and then we'll come up to you. Thank you. Hello, Amy Parker Dixon, International Baccalaureate. What role does education play in a crisis? And a second one, if I may. If you were going to do a political podcast, which conservative colleague would you do it with? <laughs> 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 Great question. That's interesting. I mean, the, the in America, people say that's a great question a lot. <laughs> and it generally means, I haven't got the faintest idea how to answer it, so let me buy some time by saying that's a great question. I mean, Alistair's obviously doing with Rory. Ed Balls has started with George Osborne. I don't know, actually. That's I think two more white men... Telling the world how to put themselves to rights may not be the, the right way. Right, um, with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Let me get to the first question about, um, I mean, the truth is, education is one of the first victims of crisis. Climate crisis, conflict, the, the, the levels of uh, um, school attendance among refugee kids, internally displaced kids, is, is, is splattered. That's why, we are, that's why we make this education technology um, investigation and innovation, uh, why it's so important. Um, let me answer it by saying we won the first, the philanthropy is moving in interesting ways. I don't know how many of you are in the philanthropic movement here, but um, the problem, one of the problems in our sector is boutique um, philanthropy or boutique partnerships that do great things for half a dozen people. Yeah. And so the... What, do you mean, what, what an example of that? So any NGO will, will have dozens of different little programs for $100,000 here or $50,000 there, and they're, not they're achieving impact, but they're not achieving scale. So the MacArthur Foundation in um, Chicago said, we're going to offer $100 million for the best idea to tackle a big global problem in 2016. And we got together with Sesame Workshop, the offshoot of Sesame Street, to say the biggest evidence base for a public policy intervention in the w rich world is early childhood education. Sure, a uh, head start in America, if you, uh, this has the biggest return. There's basically zero early childhood education for kids in conflict, even though the levels of trauma are enormous, the social and econo in, in, uh, emotional impact is huge. And so we applied, 10,000 other applications. Short, long story short, we won the $100 million prize. And we've just got the evidence evaluation of, it turned into a six-year program because of COVID rather than a five-year program. In Lebanon, because of COVID, we had to work through carers. By the way, we promised to help one and a half million kids directly and nine million kids indirectly. Nine million kids watching the TV show, one and a half million kids being reached by our staff. We've reached 3 million kids directly and 27 million kids across the region uh, with this program. So that's scale. But impact, the study in Lebanon we've just finished, one year's social, emotional, and academic progress in 11 weeks in the program. So does education matter in crisis? Oh my God, it matters. Because this was a program in the Middle East for, for victims of the Syrian crisis and the countries around so, um, you know, it matters a huge amount, and it's massively under... 3% of the global humanitarian sector, of the global humanitarian funding, goes on education, mm. even though half of the people displaced by war and conflict are kids. It's crazy. Absolutely crazy. So, um, it matters a lot. Sorry. Uh, I think I'm going to regret letting Julian Tett ask me a question. <laughs> so, uh, I'd like to say thank you for a fantastic talk. Um, you've spoken very powerfully about education in the areas you're wor working in. I'd like to ask you, if you were running Cambridge, what would you do to unleash the type of innovation, the type of risk-taking, action-orientated culture that you just called for to revitalize Britain? Wow, that is a great question. <laughs> the, uh, so, so essentially, it's asking you to tell them all what to do. Yeah. Now, um, the vice chancellor's here, so uh, w we should really direct it to her over over dinner. I mean, I tell you what. Two things, just since I like lists. Uh, the first thing is not just being a politician and uh, being diplomatic. Um, I really believe this. The great leaders are really good listeners. And you can't answer the question unless you really get into the data and listen to what it's telling you and listen to what people are telling you. So I honestly don't know. In, I don't know if it's true that they always say the colleges are too strong, the, the universities too. I don't know. So you have to find out is the first thing. But here's the second thing that I find really powerful as a tool of change. Get all of your ideas that are being promulgated in the colleges or in the university itself, and ask the people who are responsible for it the following question. If you wanted 10 times the impact for that initiative that you're taking, what would it take? I do this quite often to our team. And they say, what do you mean? 10 times, that's impossible. I say, no, it must be possible. Just tell me, what would it take to do 10, t 10 times as good on broadening your access? 
10 times as good as getting female students into the sciences, as that's involved. 10 times as good at your uh, spin outs. And try and free the imagination so that you're, up, you're, you're, you're really getting people to come to you to say, if all the constraints were taken off, how much could you achieve? And it's obviously hard, we, we <laughs> when we often do this, it's harder for the groups that have no constraint than it has is for those with constraints to come up with the big answers. But I, I, I'd really ask yourself, what are the 20 best things you're doing? How could you massively magnify the impact that they're, that they're having? Because in my experience, that's been a really good tool for getting things going. David, uh, thank you very much indeed. That. Uh, when you were talking there about the importance of having leaders, great leaders, they listen properly and get into the data. And I was just wondering whether you had seen anything of the COVID inquiry and Sir Patrick Vallance today when he was talking about uh, uh, that very question with regard to one of our uh, recent prime ministers, in fact, prime minister about three now or whatever it is, et cetera. Uh, David, thank you very much indeed for that. That was uh, uh, extremely interesting. It's good to have you back. Um, and I'm going to hand back to Sally. Uh, very briefly, very briefly. Uh, Amber Rudd is my, is who I think. Ah. And the reason is that Amber was the last person, the last minister I think who resigned, who took full responsibility and it was the council of the government. So she'd be, she's been with us now for three years. But can I just, uh, we could have gone on all of this, but um, can I just thank you hugely for being with David? Um, and for David comparing so himself. Thank, so thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.